Hello, everyone. Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace to people of goodwill. Welcome to the Kevin Gregg Show. My name is Kevin Gregg. This is a show that is designed to help you take a look at what God's calling is for your life, to listen to that calling, to follow it, to figure out what it is. What it is. Um, we talk about a variety of different things on the show, art, business, faith, spirituality. We're back again with Doug Riggle. Say hi, Doug. Hello, everybody. <laughs> We've been doing this series called The Buffalo Bible Study. It's based on a book that Doug and I have been working on, which is based on Doug's life. And the name of the book is called I'd Rather Be a Buffalo. But we're continuing. This is our third study, right? Is this third our third one? Study? Yep. Exciting. Um, Doug, how are you, by the way? Doing well. Doing well. It's uh, later in the year, and I realized, I'm like, I can see in, in reflection in my monitor that it's dark outside now, and it's only 7.30. I'm like, no, I'm not ready for this yet. Yeah, he's uh, Doug's in Ohio. I'm in Los Angeles doing this, and of course, I've had to set up a couple of extra lights because it's starting to go down, right? <laughs> it's it's a hard time of the year when it, you know, when it starts getting to fall and, you know, getting into winter, but uh, we got hope, man. We got hope right. to get us through. You know, there's something I actually wanted to mention at the top before we dove in, because I don't think that I've talked about this on our episodes yet, but you and I have been having our um, writing and editing and, and revision meetings lately. Um, you know, we're talking about this concept about, the difference between buffaloes and, and cows, right? How cows want to run away from the storm and how buffaloes kind of turn around and run through it to get to the other side. But we had been having some conversations recently where, um, and, and I think that we've, we've had similar experiences in our life. I think that sometimes we want to run into the storm because our hope is that we're going to just run through it as fast as we can and get to the other side of it and just be finished. Right. Yeah. And I think there's some interesting things that sort of sprung from that conversation. Would you, would you care to comment? So you have to give me. Sure well, the I, I think the biggest thing is this. I think the biggest thing is this, is that I think that, that yes, we want to, face the adversity, not run away from adversity or pain that we're dealing with in life. And I know that I've had experiences where I go, yes, I'm going to do this and I'm going to get through this as fast as I can. Yeah. And I have realized that sometimes that's actually not what, that's not what God's timing is in all of this. And I actually had a larger conversation with some friends earlier this week where I've really had to come to the realization to go, you know, is God, is God the source of pain and evil? No, no. Are things allowed at times? Yes. But I have to realize that God is a loving, caring father who wants the best for me. And at times certain things are allowed, but certain things are allowed because they're developing, they're developing a characteristic in me they're helping me to grow and it has to happen in God's timing and not my timing, you know? And I think that sometimes we're in these seasons. I have it. I've have it with a number of friends who are having conversations who just feel like they're just in wave after wave after wave of just pain. And they, in their mind, they can never get a break, you know? And the first, the first instinct is to blame God or to think that God is, is being cruel or um, spiteful or punishing them, you know? Um, those are just some of the thoughts, I think, that popped up for me. Yeah, you know, the more we keep using this analogy of storm, the more I realize we could probably do a whole huge multiple Bible studies on the different types of storms. Some storms you get through, a little spring rain, a little wet, bump of the day, you go on. Other storms are like a hurricane. You run through it. You think you're through it, only to find out you're only in the eye, which is calm, mm. and the storm hits again. Okay. Mm. And it's just kind of a, like a great analogy for the things that we deal with in life. Um, 
And to your point, God knows what's going on. Did God cause the storm? No, maybe not. Possibly not. Probably not. Although it is possible. Yes, sure. if God really, God really wants your attention, He'll get you swallowed by a whale. You know, it's. <laughs> um, no doubt. There's part of me that like almost wishes I had that close a relationship with God, that He cared enough about getting my attention. <laughs> I'm, I'm being very careful what I say because God's here listening to this, but at the same time, it you know, to have that kind of relationship with God, where He's like, you know what? I need to teach you this. Here's a storm. I need to teach you this. Here's a storm. Yeah. That's pretty cool when you look at it from that perspective. Yes. When you're in the midst of it, I know it's not. It stinks. Even just you talking about that right now, sometimes the storms can be of our own making. You know, yeah. like there's things that we have done or decisions that we've made or choices that we've made. And the consequences that come as a result of that, which could either be our action or at times our inaction. And I, I was having a conversation with my friend yesterday. I think a constant theme that I've been receiving time and time again is God telling me, do you trust me? Yeah. Do you trust me? Trust me. Um, because I mean it for good. If you lean into me, if you lean into me, I will turn this into good. And that's a scary proposition. That's a scary proposition. Actually, a lot of this stuff that we're talking about today actually ties into sort of the theme that we're covering this week. Because part of the theme that we're covering this week is how does God change you when you handle trials the right way? And let me ask you about that. When I say that question, handling trials the right way, how the heck do you handle trials the right way? It's, it's, it seems like it's already enough to just try to handle trials, right? I'm right. just trying to get through this. I'm just trying to get through this trial. Now we're talking about handling trials the right way while I'm going through it. You know, what are your thoughts on that? You know, there's a very simple formula that I think applies in every situation for a believer. And at, one church I was at, we called it the means of growth, but it's the means of growth for you as a baby Christian, as a seasoned Christian, whether you're going through struggles or whether you're just coasting through life, right? You've got prayer, you've got time in the word, mm -hmm. you've got fellowship with other believers, and you've got church. Those four things, if those things are part of your daily life, part of the way you do life ongoing, if you're focused on it, you're going to grow. Say those, say those one more time, what those sure. things are. Prayer. Prayer. Talking to God, you know, engaging Jesus. Yeah. Time in the word, listening mm -hmm. to God, what he's saying to us. He, he, he put a lot of wisdom in, in those uh, 60 some books of the Bible. Yeah. Um, fellowship with others. I, I've, I've run across so many people who neglect that piece or, you know, they get it new girlfriend or a new boyfriend and they neglect everyone else because yeah they've, they've, they've got what they think they want but they, they're neglecting that fellowship with other people oh my gosh and then being involved being at a church being a member of a church or being you know part of a, a bible believing god-fearing mm. church that loves people mm. that fellowship aspect was something that i like literally, man, that is something I've I've truly discovered like in the last 15 years. Now I'm 49 now, but it was like, for me, friendship was a lot of like people that I knew at work. I mean, there was, you know, there were a couple of believers I'd interact with every once in a while, but it really wasn't like fellowshipping, you know, like seeing each other talking a little bit about it. Um, or then it was like with family or then extended family stuff, right? And kind of that but not having like the true fellowship. The true fellowship started happening with me, uh, you know, a little over 15 years ago, where when I was teaching a, uh, oddly enough, I was teaching, <laughs> I got the blind leading the blind. I was teaching a religious education class, right? <laughs> Junior high school, 
students and ended up just meeting another dad, David Burke, who we just ended up, you know, he said, Hey man, I've got this, this Bible study where we kind of get together. Would you like to join us? And it was two, uh, him and two other guys. And, and all of us, it was four of us all together. And, uh, my gosh, like that was just the beginning of it, of just like literally spending time with other Christian men. For me, that was a big thing, like spending time with other Christian men and fellowshipping with other Christian men and just going, oh gosh, like I need this. I have needed this. And so it's so vital because I think that you're right. I think that sometimes people go, oh no, 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 I got my and and that is like your primary vocation, like when you get married and have a family, it absolutely is. But you need to have another element of it because, like I've talked about with my friend David, you know, I need those places where I'm able to talk to somebody else about the challenges that I'm facing in my marriage and my family. But mainly because I'm talking about it with other Christian men, the idea that they can hear me and sympathize with what's going on, but then to be able to go, hey, can we also talk to you about like God's perspective on how to love your wife more or how to love your children more? Or we totally hear the pain you're going through and here's some tips that may help you through this. But can you also see like their side and how maybe they're hurting and how maybe you can help? Where that wasn't the case with people that I had at work. Instead, it would devolve into, oh yeah, yeah. it just turns into like a complete, you know, griping and moaning fest, you know? Like everybody's from like from the cast of King of Queens or whatever, you know, it's just like, what, what is this? Right. We're all griping about our, you know, it's ridiculous, ridiculous. It but, was funny Year, years ago. I was, um, I had a small staff at one of my jobs and um, I, we had a calendar and this is when, you know, electronic calendars were still fairly new, mm -hmm. but I had a calendar and I had put on it, you know, my time with Rick, my time with Leo. And there were consistent times week after week, and it was after work hours, but I just kept it there that kept reminding me of, of you know, I needed to go do this or go to visit them, or we're going to meet at this, you know, get pizza tonight or whatever it was. And Sue, one of my employees, she looked at my calendar and she, 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 she stopped me one day. She's like, you have time with Rick and Leo and, you know, maybe you know, one or two others every week. What do you do? Mm -hmm. Like, what do you mean what we do? We get together, mm -hmm. but what do you do? Like mm -hmm. talk, mm -hmm. you know, hang out, mm -hmm. conversation. And she's like, I only have friends who want to get together when they either need something mm -hmm. from me, want something from me, or want to go do a, see a movie, or want to go mm -hmm. out and go shopping. Yeah, she's like I've never met anyone who just spends time with people to spend time with people. I'm like, yeah. and I told her, I said that's the value. Yes, I mean, that's I. You need everyone needs people in their life they can say anything to at any time of the day or night. I yeah. know right now I could pick up my phone and still to this day after thirty some years call Rick, call his wife Nancy, and say, "Hey, I need prayer. I need help. I need mm -hmm. your advice," and they would they would be there. Yeah, and I would be there for them. I mean, it's it's reciprocal. It's got to be reciprocal. It can't be one way. <laughs> I think I really want guys to hear this that are listening to this. This is so much more than just like, oh, we go out to the bar and have a couple of drinks or, right. oh, hey, we just sit around and we watch the football game. It's not that like the, even those examples. That's basically the example what Doug just gave with his coworker saying, oh, only I got friends that they want to go out to the movies or go out to shop or do all that stuff. It's like literally like spending the time and saying, what's on your heart? What's going on with you this week? What's bothering you? What can we pray? What what can we pray about? You know, and like honestly, that stuff uh, that Doug is talking about, it's these, it's this gift that God has given us, and it's like these emotional deposits that we can make that we can make into other people's lives, and that they can make into our lives, and it's like, it's so foundational, man. It's so foundational. You know? Absolutely. I was fortunate enough, I found that almost immediately after I became a believer and I got involved in a fellowship with people who valued relationships. Now, we were kind of unique, other people around us, you know, the, the group, you know, Bible say would grow and then they'd split into two. And the leaders would say, well, you know, the two of you, you know, we're going to 
split you into different groups and we're like, no, we're going to be together. We're going to do life together. <laughs> they didn't like it, but that was us. We kind of bucked the system with that. Yeah. Because our friendship was too valuable. We were too important to each other. Hmm. And we've just, and through them, we've, we've raised kids together. We've done life together. We've cried on each other's shoulders. We've been there when, you know, one's been in the hospital or, you know, a parent has died or when my son committed suicide, I remember um, the, the next day, Rick driving me around, like, where do you need to go? What do you need to do? Um, when my wife left and, you know, ended up in divorce, Rick and his wife were like, we're going to Mammoth Cave for a long weekend. You're going to come with us. Take, take time off. You're going to come with us. You, you need to get away. Yeah. It wasn't a, they, they never waited for me to ask for help. They just, yeah. because they knew me, they knew that I needed help. Isn't that funny? That's a thing. Maybe you can speak to this. We're going, we're going a little off track, but you know, that's what conversations are. You know, going through going through the grief and the tragedy that you've gone through and you, you can talk about it actually it does tie in a way because in a way you you end up becoming an asset for other people, you know, that this, this is part of the change that happens when you go through your trial. Um, you know, and we've talked about it before. Everyone is so averse of the, you, they, they just want to stay away from, pain, death, any of that stuff. It's like in, in 20th and 21st century North America, it's like everybody just wants to wrap a bow on it and just be done and just like move on and go, no, 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 it's over. It's finished. It's done. Right. Um, and I'm wondering, I don't know how much of this that you received after your son committed suicide. Um, but there, there can be a tendency from people and believe me, man, I've been guilty of this before with people that I know. When somebody's going through a tragedy, we put the onus on the person that's going through the tragedy. And so what happens is instead of getting involved and getting in the muck and doing the things like your, you know, your friend Rick and his wife would do to say, you're coming with us, we're hanging out, or here I'm driving you, kind of like taking action. Sometimes you have people that go, if you need anything, call me, you know? And I think that when a person is kind of going through grief in the moment, I don't know if they even have the facility or the capability to be able to do that and to go, I can't even, I can't even think right now. Right. How, how can I even form, how can I even form the ideas to say exactly what it, what it is that I need and how you can help me? Yeah. It almost feels like, if you have somebody that's in your life that's going through a tragedy that you just show up and do. Yeah, absolutely. I, when uh, friends of mine, uh, a friend of mine, Janet, she and I led our church's um, divorce care group for about seven years. Mm -hmm. And to us, it was just great time working together. We learned pretty quickly that the people would come to us completely broken. And we started asking questions like, okay, have you done your bills? No, we're going to come over. One of us is going to come over. Let's sit down. Let's walk through your bills. Okay. Have you gone grocery shopping? No. Okay. What do you need? And it's, it's those basic things of life that in, sometimes in your grief, you just push aside. You forget to pay your bills, which can lead to other issues. Um, other tragedy, other uh, drama and, and um, storms later on. Forget to do the basic things. Clean the house. Mm. You just don't have the, sometimes in people's depression, especially, they don't even have the energy to get up and clean the house no. or to get themselves out of bed and get a shower. No. And having those people there, I remember, odd example, but I had a kidney stone once and I remember they, they, for whatever reason, they didn't want to like bust it. They just wanted it to pass normally. Yep. Which was fine, but it hurt. <laughs> and I can remember one evening, so Rick was over, we were talking, and suddenly it hit so bad. I'm like, I'm going to throw up. Ran upstairs to the bathroom. He sat on the edge of the tub. I sat with my head over the toilet. 
he's put his hand on my back. He was yeah. just there for me. Yeah. No yeah. words. No, all you'll get through this. It was just a presence. Hmm. And he was he was exhibiting the presence of God hmm. Jesus, at that moment. We always think we have to be there and say things. Just being there many times is a great way to help get people through a storm. Man, Rick Warren just talked about that. Like he, I love the example that he gives with Job's friends about the one thing that they got right. The one thing that they got right was as he was mourning all of the loss and the tragedy and everything that happened to him within a day, you know, that the thing that his friends got right is when you read, when you read Job, they showed up and they also got in sackcloth and ash and they just sat with him before they started opening up their mouths and then saying, Hey, you know, you brought this on yourself, right? <laughs> but, you know, Rick Warren's example is to go, they got the first part of that right, which is sometimes you just got to sit there in the sackcloth and the ash with the other person. And to your point, sometimes there just aren't any words. There just aren't any words, you know? Did you ever... Did you ever encounter this? Because this sort of came up for me as you were talking. Again, a little bit off track. Way to go, Kevin. Uh, but, but did you ever have you have you ever experienced in your years of healing? You know, in the grief, you're you're always dealing with some version of grief over time. And I think that this is a, a trap that can happen for Christians. Did you ever find yourself overextending yourself too much in service and just burning yourself out and going, yes, yes, I need to do this to heal. I need to do this to heal. And then all of a sudden you've got resentment, exhaustion, all of this other stuff that's and it, you, you've just done like counterintuitive work. I can tell by your, I can tell by your body language. The answer is no. So, uh, <laughs> this is why I am the way I am today. And it's, I, I need to work through this still. People think grief always shows up as being sad. Grief will show up in so many ways where I don't say no to requests and there's still good things I can, I'm involved in. I get involved in so many things because number one, you know, like living largely alone, I don't, I'm not around people. I'm out in the country away from people. Um, I don't have an active social life. I don't date. Um, I go to church. Uh, my Bible study is actually the one with you, you know, but it's all virtual. Yeah. Um, but this is how I end up. I'm on three nonprofit boards and I run a nonprofit and I have a full-time job and I'm working with you two nights a week on a book. I know. And it's all great stuff. But I realize there's a part of that, that deep down inside, it's, I don't want to be alone. And I'm dealing with the grief of loneliness. Mm. And I, it's, it's allows me to be around people. So I don't always have to think about what's down inside of me. Mm. The grief that's still there. And people, I remember about two uh, probably more like six months after my son passed away. I was at work and I was just thinking about him and it was occupying my brain. I was just mindlessly walking from one building to another. And I saw a guy that I, I worked with before. And he's like, dude, what's wrong? I said, I'm just kind of missing my son. And he's like, still? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm like, six months uh, later, six still. months later. Still. Wow. Uh, How do you? How, what do you say in that? <laughs> I, I just smile and walk on. I, oh my gosh. Uh, examples of something. <laughs> no. Here's what not to do. Wow. Well, yeah. I've been guilty of stuff, man. I can't. We all have. I can't. I'm not going to say it on this show. I'll tell it to people. But I have told people to get over things that are like <sighs> heaven shut your mouth you have no authority in that part oh my gosh and through all this i realized you know that's god's giving me the perspective people are intending well even if it doesn't come across good 99.99 percent of the time people have good intentions 
So I look at it like that. Yes. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Even when I adopted my son, people ask stupid questions. Trust me, anyone who's ever adopted knows the stupid questions. Well, what are his real parents like? No, I'm the real parent. Well, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I do, but I'm not going to answer that question because I'm the parent. Yes. And trust me, there are dozens of questions that people ask that are like, why is this an in your business for one? But anyway, that's a whole nother topic. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. But I'll people are so. well-intended and I accept that. You know what? I think that that's a great way to look at it. People are well-intended. People are well-intended. I have this in my notes, which I think is really good, especially as things have happened to you, things, how you've changed over, over the time by going through the hardships. I mean, we can, we can both give examples of this, of changes that have happened. But one of the things that you, that we have down here in the notes, which I think is amazing over time, God flips the world's perspective. Second Corinthians 12, verse 10, for the sake of Christ, then I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Um, that just that that sentence about flipping your perspective, and also um, that verse from Corinthians. It really, it does happen over time. I think it's why people just. I think it's why people look at Christianity and they just like look at it like, what are you talking about? Like if I were to read something like that, you're strong when you're weak, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's what it is. And people just go, no, that's not how the world works. That's not how it's supposed to work. And yet you see the evidence of it in people that are walking with the Lord. You see this. You see the evidence when people have that peace and going like what you talked about. How can you be calm in this storm? How can you be calm? And the ultimate thing is, is it's the transformative thing that happens with Christ where you just go, yeah, who I, I've said this so many times. I feel so much like Peter on the day that Jesus is talking to the majority of other followers and he makes the hard statement of eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the people say, no, no. This is a hard saying. You can't really mean this. And he doubles down. He doubles down and he says it again to them, yeah. to this group. And a lot of them leave. A lot of them leave him that day. And he turns around to the apostles and says, what about you? And I feel like Peter, which is like, Lord, where else am I going to go? Right. Where else am I going to go? Yeah. And that's what I feel like a lot in my journey where I just go, God, this is it. Like, you're all I've got. If I don't have you, I've got oblivion, man. I've yeah. got an abyss of nothingness because I've done a little peek over that side and no bueno. No. I got, you know, and it, and it honestly all does flip, you know? Your thoughts on that? It, the thing that makes that thought possible is understanding that this life is not all there is. No. This is a flash of lightning compared to the rest of eternity. Mm. And I've got to keep looking forward to that time when I'm going to be in perfect fellowship with God. I'm going to have a body that doesn't ache after a workout. I'm going to have perfection. I'm going to have great fellowship with everyone I'm around mm. in some point in time. And there's, there's not going to be there's not going to be gossip or worrying right. about what somebody else is saying or feeling anxiety or getting frustrated over something. Those don't exist. Those don't exist. Well, and it's hard because we came out of the me generation. I remember one of my sister's husbands, his favorite phrase was look out for number one. Right. And for, for the longest time, that's what I operated under. It's like that's what we were taught. But when you look at the way God set up this world. If God wants me to put Kevin's needs before my own, that feels counterproductive. But if everyone operates that way, someone's putting my needs ahead of theirs. So my needs are getting met. And it's getting met in a way that's unexpected and even better because it's not just me doing it myself. Yes. It's someone caring for me. Mm. 
And that's an amazing thing. Yeah. But we've lost that. Even within the church, sometimes we've lost that of care mm. for one another in a way that is sacrificial and agape. But you're so right on the nose. I mean, this is stuff that I'm going through on a, on a current step study evaluation for myself, right? I have for decades now, part of my upside down part that the wrong upside down part of my walk, um, you know, God's doing a little bit of an exa examination with me where it's like, there's still a part of Kevin that's looking for the transactional part of all this. Hey God, I've been a good boy. Hey, I've been a good follower. Hey, I've done this. Hey, look at what I'm doing for other people. And, you know, I think that God's like saying, no, no, I get that. That's a good thing. But just do, just do it out of love. Like, just do it out of love and do it with a non-expectant heart and do it because you want to do it. Do it because you want to be of service and to be there. And, and, and the other side of that too is there's many times that I go to do things that I don't want to do, right? And that I'm so grateful that I have done it. The perfect example is in men's recovery groups or in our, our Bible study things that we do, you know, three times a week. It's like, guess what? I don't want to get up super early. I don't want to be getting up super early in the morning, getting the stuff done that I've got to get done. But there have been so many times I've been either in those meetings or in the middle of those things and go, gosh, I'm so great. I'm so grateful that I was here for this. I'm so grateful that I showed up to do this today, you know? I've got, I've got some advice and I'm single. So all you married couples take it with a grain of salt, but listen carefully when you're married and a birthday comes along and your spouse says, I don't want anything special. They're lying. Yes. They're lying to make you feel good. Yes. And everyone, as I was actually working on the book, just before our conversation started here and talking about the time, one time in my life when my friends surprised me. And everyone will say, I don't want anything. Like my birthday's coming up here in a couple of weeks. So I'll tell people, I don't want anything. But that surprise meant more to me in this world than anything else. And I remember very vividly the details of that. And it's not about the surprise, but it's just about being celebrated. Yeah. One of my pastors years ago, he, he had this phrase where he said, the church is the place where people should come to love and be loved, know and be known, celebrate and be celebrated hmm. and it's just it's such a, an amazing thing it's like there are verses in the bible where god talks about he sings over us hmm. how amazing is that that the god of the universe would sing over me that's so cool <laughs> it's amazing it is amazing it's so so good who am i that he would do that he is i am someone that he loves and that's that's part of flipping that perspective is I have to understand who I am to him. Yeah. I'm having a, I've been having a conversation lately with a guy where it's like trying to process that, you know, sometimes really trying to process the fact that, that you are here, you are here because the creator of the universe thought of you and wanted you yeah. and made you, you know, made you come into being. I mean, it's like, that's spectacular, you know, yeah. spectacular. Let's touch on this last thing really quick before we wrap it up. Endurance, 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 endurance. I've got in my notes here, we're all in a marathon and God needs us. He wants us to endure. The enemy wants nothing more to sideline a believer in Christ. If the enemy can make us ineffective, we become useless in this world what are your thoughts on that man it's a uh... endurance is the hardest thing and we we think oh i went through a trial and i survived and i'm, I'm good i've endured it's not in that moment it's every single moment of every day mm -hmm. and there are thousands of things that keep us from enduring Cell phone. Mm. In between meetings, sometimes I'll go on here. I'll look at my how my retirement plan's doing. I'll play a game of Angry Birds. I'll 
And any of those things aren't bad. But every time I do it, I'm taking you away from God. Mm. God's going to care for me in my retirement mm. in ways I'm probably not even anticipating. Mm. Angry Birds is enjoyable, but God's word is even more enjoyable. Mm. And again, not that any of those things are bad. And I, I'll be the first to admit, I will sit out on Netflix and binge watch something and feel refreshed by it and enjoy it. But when you do it every day, when you do it every night, when you realize the number of hours we sit in front of a two-dimensional screen, which COVID didn't help <laughs> that any. It's, it's strange, it's isn't it? It's strange that it's like black screens. You know yeah. what I mean? Like it's it's one of those things where I think like if somebody from a thousand years ago was transported and saw that we all had these magic, mystical black screens, I think that their first inclination would be to go, what sorcery and evil black magic is this, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, growing up, you know, Every family maybe had one TV. And now <laughs> you've got one behind you. I've got one behind me. And the screens. I'm looking and at a screen and the phone. And, and you know, phone. Kate and I are in bed. We're both looking at our oh, we don't have a TV in the in the we don't have a TV in the bedroom. <laughs> right? I have a TV, iPad, and my phone in the bedroom. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh my word. That's nuts, man. But it is. here's but here's here's a comparison. Well, I think what it is, Doug, is I think that we're always like we are seek we are seeking relief along the way, right? Like, and I get this especially with the endurance, right? And God does God does occasionally. It is a continual journey that we're on, and God does provide oasises every once in a while. He really yeah. does. He provides these oasises where we get to rest, where we get to get a drink of water and rest. But we're also not meant to stay in the oasis forever. We're right. supposed to move on. There'll be other. There'll be other rests, and even that happened with uh with Elijah, right? Like Elijah, you know, a very interesting thing about Elijah the prophet. He has this thing where, uh, oh my gosh, what's the what's the name of the woman Jezebel? I think it's Jezebel, right? Yeah. I think that's her name. Yeah, Jezebel's coming after him. Jezebel and her husband, they're uh, in charge of the the kingdom. That's uh, and, and they're, they're after him. And this is right after he has had the, basically the contest with all of the false prophets, right? Where it's just like, we're going to have a wood burning contest, you know, I love all, that. all of these guys, they get all of their stuff. They get all of their timber. They put it all in. They're all chanting. He says, Hey, maybe your God's asleep. Cause he can't hear you. Right. Trying to say, just go ahead and make it. And then here comes Elijah. And he says, yeah, build that wood and tell you what, soak it, soak it with water, soak it. And they drench this thing like there's no way it'll catch. And then he prays to God and he asks for God to to send the fire and burns that up and then also ends up like destroying and killing the other prophets. So so Elijah's had like a huge win. He's basically had this huge win that's like, this is it. We want to talk about who the real God is. And then Jezebel goes ballistic and yeah. basically puts out an order that says, I want him dead. I want this guy dead. And Elisha, after this huge triumph, what does he do? He splits into the wilderness and he's gone. And he's just like, it, it's so weird, this juxtaposition of, of what happens. This guy that's so deep and rock solid in his faith where he can call on for God to burn up and incinerate drenched wood and then here's this death threat from this woman and then splits and part of that thing is while he's out in the wilderness he ends up getting into sort of like a canyon area where he really can't be found he's like in this canyon area and there's really nothing around him but the lord makes sure that there's water that comes to him so that he can drink and then brings these crows that fly over him that drop so he can eat food and so he can rest for a while and he does it for a while and he's hanging out and he's hanging out and then eventually god stops the god stops the water from running and he stops the birds from coming and elijah is just like are you trying to kill me it's like get up 
I need you to keep going. I need you to keep going. And I think what happens is that we're, we're looking for, we're looking for this respite because it, because you are right. Right. It is about like, God is again, remember what Doug, Doug said, everyone, this life is like a flash of lightning. It's a flash of lightning compared to what our true life is compared to what our eternal life is. And, but God's got some work to do with us and on us during this flash that we're in. And so many of us just want to hang out in the comfortable resting place, right? Or we get a little taste of what, of what could be or what is feels good, right? I always describe it as like birthday cake, right? It's like birthday cake's awesome. When you have like a great slice of birthday cake, it's amazing. I shouldn't be having birthday cake three times a day for every meal of my life. Right. Because otherwise it's going to kill me. Right. It's going to kill me. And I think that that's what we do with our kind of with our pleasures of the flesh. Right. Like whether it's the like, oh, well, this is fun that I got to do this. And now I want to do this all the time. Yeah. And God's saying, it's okay. You get to have a taste of that, but I've got something better for you. We're in, we're in training, my friend. We're in training. Keep striving. Paul, you know, he's like, I run the good race. I buffet my body. It's, it's, it's for, to, for us to keep going. You know, so many times God tries to teach us some things and help us through trials. And then we settle into that respite. And that respite becomes this ongoing thing that we don't want to get out of. But we're also not growing. We're not learning. We're, we just keep going through that. Um, and sometimes we refuse to move. Mm. And that's that's really when it gets, you know, God's going to think, fine. After a while, he's like, stay there. I, I you know, and, and when you're ready to move, I'll be here. Well, that's but it. when they, when they, I, I guess is kind of my point for this is eventually something worse is going to come along. And if you've not been training for it, if you've yeah. not been facing the smaller trials, and when that bigger thing comes along, you're not going to know how to deal with it. That that's, I, I, and we, you and I have talked about this before. I get so concerned with some of our youth in America today that they can't even handle words that may mean something different to them. Like, I'm sorry, a few words, if that's what ways you, you like you're screaming and crying because someone said a word you didn't like. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's kind yeah, of like, no, I get it. I'm like, wait till your parents pass away. Wait till you're the executive of the estate and have to divvy up your, your parents' things with your siblings. Wait until, you know, you crash your car or someone you love is in the hospital or, or you get any of the thousand other things that are going to happen. Yeah. yeah. You get hit by cancer. You get hit by yeah. something that comes out of the blue that you have no idea. And to your point with, with the, the stuff that you're saying, if you're not moving and striving forward, like still waters, two things are going to happen. It's going to either stagnate and rot or it's going to dry up and be gone. Yeah. It's going to change anyway. Guess what? It's going to change anyway. Right. And more than likely, if you're hanging out in a place, it's going to change for the worse. Yeah. You might as well keep moving. Yeah. So birthday cake will make you sick after a while. <laughs> okay. Now I want cake. That's the best. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think that is a good place to end this. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray it out, brother. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to, again, reflect on you and just thank you for your mercies that you give us as we move forward. Help us, encourage us, and inspire us to keep moving and striving, um, even in the midst of it. Sometimes we just want to either curl up or ignore it. Um, send us those people and situations that can help us get through those moments, and more importantly, uh, help us to grow and listen to you and what you're guiding us to do. Thank you, Father. God, I just... I'm amazed at how much you love us, Lord. You love us enough 
to teach us through trials. You love us enough to send your son to die on the cross for us, God. You love us more than any other being ever could and ever will, Lord. And all you ask for us is, is to move through this life, God, and to prepare ourselves for the life to come, Lord. And I just pray for all of us, anyone listening, myself included, Kevin included, Lord, that we're not running away from the tough times, God, that we're running to you. Each every step we take is a moment that we move towards eternity. Some of us can sit back and just wait for it to show up, God, but I pray that more and more believers stand up and start running and start moving into the storm, start moving into the place where they can find an abundance of love and grace in a way that they never expected, God. You, you desire and you love to surprise us, Father, with your love. I just pray that for everyone listening, God, that you find ways to surprise them with your love as they take a first step and do some, some pain that's maybe new, maybe old. I just lift everyone up to you, God, and pray, Lord, that you, you teach them something new. In Jesus' name, man. Amen. 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 Awesome, buddy. Very, very cool. Well, guys, we've got at least one more of these coming your week and next uh, soon. <laughs> I wanted to say next week, soon. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, all I could say is thanks for watching this episode. Hey, do me a favor. If you liked this episode, do me a favor, hit the like button, also subscribe button. And at the very least, if there's something here that resonated with you that you think that you want a friend to be able to hear, share it. That would be an amazing thing so we can get that message out. Great way to support is head over to kevingreg.locals.com where I'll be putting out material for my supporters. I have been, be, uh, uh, Doug, Doug knows the story of what's been going on. These, la just a brief, brief recap. These uh, last six weeks, almost two months now, it's been, uh, you know, as you can tell, as I'm in, uh, in my son's other room, it's been, uh, it's been a, wonderful crazy blessing but a lot of just like whoa hold on hold on so again uh just thank you guys for showing up and watching and listening to this stuff and the stuff is coming believe me god's working on me to go kevin let's figure it out even if you're filming it in a car let's figure it out make it happen so there you go that's where i'm at <laughs> doug always a pleasure man thanks so much all right, friend. All right. we'll see you later everybody. Bye-bye, gang. Bye. Bye.